it's if you don't adopt it now, I feel like your competitors are already doing it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the Sevo Show. We have Ashe Shah here. This guy, met him last year and I fell into the marketing world by accident. He will find out in a second. But um, the way that I describe Ashe is he's an ads guy, but more so he understands what needs to be done behind the ads. He's not just going... Give me the money and I will run ads and you'll get no results. This guy actually posts the ROAS, the return on ad spend, his receipts with his clients on LinkedIn. I vibe with that a lot because it's complete transparency and what does a customer want? Return on investment, making sure they don't waste money. And most importantly, they're not just making a two-time return where they're paying for their initial run and paying for his services. It's way more than that. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Savo. Glad to be here. <laughs> so let's go back to the beginning. Who are you? How did you get to where you are today by, you know, like why, why marketing, bro? What the fuck? Why marketing? That's a great question. So I've got to take it back to probably high school. I was really smart. I should say book smart in high school, quite good at maths and science. So I was like, what can I do in uni? Naturally, mech eng, engineering is like the logical choice to do. So I was like, cool, we're good at maths and science. Let's just go down that pathway because I have no idea what I want to do from high school, literally. So yeah, got into Curtin Uni for mechanical engineering, did three years of that. And then I did vacation work at a um, very large mining company for three months. And I was bored shitless the entire time. I was like, oh my God, what? Like, I can't do this for the rest of my life. If this is it, if I've got to taste it in like three months. So then I um, only had one more year left of yep. the course. I'm like, I'm going to quit right now. You may as well just get the piece of paper. And then I was like, let me tack on finance as well. Or like a commerce kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. like I always like business. My dad has always had a business. I grew up in Kenya. So all my uncles, everyone's been in business for like a long time since I was born. So um Naturally, I'm like, cool, let's just do commerce. We'll learn about the big world of business. We can then graduate uni and just be super rich. Um, so tacked on finance as well. And then I think it's in our fifth year of uni, me and my best mate, Tommy, we um, were sitting on the beanbags at Curtin on the grass area, if anyone knows where the sloped area is. And then um, we're like, let's start a business because like, you know, like we're, we're learning finance here, commerce. The best way to learn is by actually doing it. Let's get our hands dirty. So let's like start something and we're like, I don't know what the hell we'll start. So love it. He had a, the great idea of um, we should buy drones really cheap online and then flip them. I'm like, nah, that sounds pretty stupid. Drones are not, not going to be a big thing at all in the world. <laughs> That's dumb, Tommy. Why would you say that? And then um, we did some research online and then it just popped up on the corner. Like you may also like this. And it was a bubble soccer suit. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. I was like, that's the one. That sounds like pretty cool because I haven't really seen that in Perth. So we should definitely like go down that pathway. did some research, um, found there's only like one or two companies. We called up um, Yui on that day to figure out, cool, probably insurance is probably going to be the biggest cost for us. Let's kind of find that one out. Um, and then they couldn't insure us because it was too niche. So we just dropped it there. <laughs> and then... I think I went traveling for like two or three months and then the summer break came back to Perth and then I called up my mate. I'm like, hey, are you still keen to kind of do this? Because it's our final year here in uni. Like we may as well just do it now. Um, I had 3,000 bucks. He had 3K. Uh, we just put both our last 3K in to kind of buy the first batch of um, equipment that we needed. And that's how we got started with Bubble Bash. Now, to answer your question with marketing, so because we were very bootstrapped, we were doing everything ourselves. So that's where we had to kind of learn about marketing, kind of hiring team members, all those things ourselves. So that's where I learned about like social media advertising, Google advertising, all those kind of sources to bring in new clients because our friends and family, like it's only so much you could do. So we like needed to get customers. So that was my introduction into marketing. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. And how did your business go? Learned a lot from Bubble Bash, you're asking? Yeah. yeah so, um, God, so we did a <laughs> a really good growth curve was we did 100 bookings in about three months because we thought we'd be extremely genius. And we did a scoop on deal. 
turns out back then scoop on like it was just power to them because they they taught us a lot but um yeah we were working like absolute dogs in that one but pretty much in three months we doubled the business so we can buy a second set as well yeah so our capacity increased that way but we kind of ran that business for about oh, three years i think wow three years is a good run three years we started another brand called um archery skirmish as well because we're like let's diversify we because people only buy bubble soccer once. They're not going to kind of do it twice. Archery skirmish. Archery skirmish, yeah. It's like bows and arrows with a foam tip arrow with uh, bunkers and stuff. So the smart idea oh, was like... Oh, yes, I've played that. Yeah. I've played that at, uh, what's it called? The uh, what, that, that center in, off Vincent Street. Um, Lo- Loftus. Loftus. Yeah. yeah was that your setup? We've done a few bookings there, yeah. That would in have the been... In the past. I don't yeah. Know, yeah, yeah. But that was, I think that was like in, internal setup because they yeah. would drag it out of that office. But that's cool, man. So three years for going back to Bubble Bash, your, yeah. your bubble soccer. Yeah. Um, was that your first business you ran? Yeah, was the first one, yes. And how old were you then? Go, go back to 2016. So I would have been, it's a very, very question. Go to some quick maths here. I was probably 24. Amazing. 24. So, so 24 yeah. was your first business. Now before, um, for the audience, because mm. the uh, younger audience will be listening yeah. as well. Um, was there any was there anything that you did to start making money when you were younger than that? Paper rounds. That was my first. No, my- actually, no, I've got to take it back. So okay. the first dollar I ever made was I um, did a lemonade stand with my cousin when we first came to Perth here. Yeah. That was outside uh, their house. So that was the first dollar i guess i made and how did you go you made a dollar how much how i have much? no remember? idea how much we actually made i think people <laughs> just feel pity on us so they gave us like some some coin but that was like the, the first one that was the first leverage you had get yeah. the pity you're a child yeah <laughs> that was rocket <laughs> is it wrong to teach your kids that <laughs> no but then the second one i did i think it was a couple of years after i was probably still in my teens but i went around the neighborhood to yeah. wash people's windows in cars yeah. i thought like cool I know what it was. I just want to make my own mm. money from like a young age. Yeah. Um, so that was the second thing I did. And then another guy, I think, just let me do it because I went, I like, think, probably 20 houses. Everyone said no. And then one guy, I think, felt sad for me again. Yeah. He's like, sure, you can wash my uh, car. That's cool. Yeah. 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 My, my very first dollar I made was probably either paper rounds or yeah. my mum was actually doing tailoring and um, suit like alterations yep. for a, a brand called Man to Man at the time. Yes, yeah. And my job was to un- unclip the, the bottoms of the, you know, let the, let the legs down a little mm-hmm. bit longer. She yep. paid me two bucks a pair of pants and I would do like one pair like in five seconds. I'm like, sick. Sick, yeah. And, and then I remember my first $50 I made, there's a picture of me holding it in my PJs, like my first 50 bucks. Yeah. And what I bought with it, a Fox, you know, that brand, that yes. old school Fox. <laughs> I, bu- I bought a Fox yep. hat, a red yep. one. And Beautiful. I was like, sick, yeah, <laughs> sick, commercialized, <laughs> you know, con- consumerized, you know. Yeah. And um, then after that, uh, my favorite story of, of my teen's entrepreneurial mm. side of business, mm. it wasn't an official business. It was technically illegal um, or frowned upon, I guess. But um, I would go to my sister's uh, daycare center and they had all these chocolate boxes to sell. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll do that. Oh, mm. Sounds like fun. Grab that, sold it within a day yeah within half a day and and at the time is when my year year 10 mm. they uh banned sugary like lollies and stuff from cool. the um the canteen i was yeah. like okay well we can still fundraise and <laughs> ri- wicked and then i would go back to the uh child care uh place and go sold another one sold another one sold another one give them the envelope of the money yeah, yeah. and i thought it was great and then i thought i didn't like the part where i had to give the money back mm. so then i'm like what do i do now and then I discovered the bulk shop, you know, the yes. bulk, bulk save, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and zombie chews. <laughs> There's a box of zombie chews for $20 yeah. and there was 50 of them in there. Yeah. And before the ban of sugar, the zombie chews that would, be, that would be sold at school were selling for 20 cents each. Yeah. And I was like, ah, profit margin. That's where I've learned about profit margins mm. the first time. So I was like, no, nah, I'm going to sell them for a dollar. See what happens. Just see what happens. Yeah. Got a Coca-Cola one, Coca-Cola yep. flavor, because I was like, that's my favorite. Went out there, tested the market in the school grounds and had a couple of people go on a dollar. It's a ripoff. I'm like, where else are you going to get yeah. to? <laughs> Do you want it or not? <laughs> Do you want it or not? Do you want the hit? <laughs> and then within one, one lunchtime, I sold it out. And I was like, 
okay. Yeah. So I made thirty dollars profit. So I went and got two boxes the next day, and my my school bag at the, by this time it's getting pretty heavy with yeah. candy, and um, lollies. Sorry, Australians. They don't Australians, like it when yep. I say candy. <laughs> so anyway, I sold those two boxes in a day, and I'm yeah. like, I'm at I'm up I'm at a hundred bucks. Started yeah. with twenty. I'm doing good here. And the best thing about that was I mentioned my mum with every school story because she's a teacher at the yeah. school. I had a stock room eventually. I had five boxes. At home? At my mum's in my mum's office at school. Good God. So I could go to school with the box in hand, sell it all before school, run to her office to see if I can grab another box and then see if I can hustle throughout period one and two before recess. And then recess. Business is open, business yep. is booming, you know. <laughs> Lunch, get a third box. I think I think I made a hundred and fifty <laughs> bucks in one day record. And I'm like, this is fun. This is really fun, you know. Did you not get caught? Like, did not people not like this is the best thing about having yeah. a communist uh, coming from a <laughs> communist background. True. We all have each other's backs. Yeah. And <laughs> So the teachers caught on to us saying, what are you fundraising for? Because I was like <laughs> the only one selling anything yeah. and I was doing it openly where everyone else like would bring like a couple of lollies in yeah, and like, yeah, do yeah. it on the slide. I'm like, no, I don't give a fuck. And I was like, yeah, I don't know, footy or something. Footy. <laughs> so, they, so then they would go to, to mum naturally and I'm like, and well? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> She Call had my mom. back, man. She had my back. <laughs> and like um, that that was like the real proper start of like the okay. business journey, eh? The business journey. And yeah. if you and if you have an idea and you give it a go, and yeah. if you have setbacks, you can have a team of people or, or like my mum, she was she was my you know back end operations manager. She was like, no, nah, I think the cool. main thing also said as well, you got feedback as well, because yeah. your fa- fa- favorite one was Coke, yeah? You yeah. said so yeah, like, yeah it's yeah, gonna work. Yeah, Coca-Cola. Yeah. Coca-Cola. Yeah. Mm. Not selling Coke yeah. kids. <laughs> but um my I actually evolved that into a like a cartel sort of thing where the year eights, um, I would give them ten at a time to go sell for me for a dollar each. Yeah. And if they could do it, they bring back the ten dollars, and I'd give them a zombie chew for free. <laughs> this, this is definitely a, a gang here, mate. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't read any books or yeah. anything about how to diversify and branch out yeah. and you know grow the business distribution distribution network. <laughs> I was, I just went, I just, it's like I felt like I invented that. Yeah. I thought I was like the coolest person. I'm, yeah. Now I look at, it, I was, oh, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> but like that, that time where it lived in Kalgoorlie as well. Yeah. So I had one kid bring $20 note in and mm. bought 20 of them. I'm like, mate, you're my best customer. Mm. And then I started to like nurture that relationship. Oh, my guy, my guy. Like, you know, like mm. like if, if I can go to him every day or once a week and he can take pretty much half of the stock from one box, mm. I need to reward him. I need to nurture that and I would give him extra and then mm. that, that would build. And then I'd just pretty much resell a whole box to one person. Mm. I don't care what they did with it. They would eat it or they would resell it themselves. Yeah. Or I mean, if they resold it themselves cheaper, so they'd, be to a, the, they'd uh, be at a loss. The wholesale side of things now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was my first like, experience there. Yeah. But um, I want to go back to you. Yes. And I want you to, to talk about um, your journey from school where mm-hmm. you were doing these jobs to then going into your um, mechanical engineering yep. and then realising you didn't want to do it. Mm. You didn't want to do it because it wasn't for you or was it, it wasn't too hard, I'd imagine. I actually think uni, controversial kind of thing, but I think use, uni is actually very easy to get through easily. <laughs> Just got to know how the system works. Mm. So I don't think... Actually, you know, to be fair, I think I'm quite good at learning. So, if, but I'm very good at learning logically. So, if there's a formula, I'm like, cool, that's very easy. So, just yeah. plug it in, we're set. It's Maths. a system. Yeah, it's a it's, system. It's binary too. Yeah, <clears throat> and I, I really hated English as well because it was subjective. I felt I it was hated too it then in high school, but now I'm like, they got to actually think there. Yeah, which, yeah. Which yeah. is hard at the time, yeah. yeah. But now I'm like, that was, was it, so powerful. It teaches you negotiation and, yeah. and you know, persuasion and all that stuff. I love it. It's I also, love, the, love there's it. no right or wrong I learned in, in mm. that class as long as you can kind of reflect. Your point. Yeah, or your reflect. point. So why are you thinking yeah. in this way? Yeah. yeah. But they didn't get 
get that in our heads back then, so I still hated it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. <It's>, um, <clears throat> I, I remember. Mm. I remember because I I've got a science degree. Yeah. Because I was teaching science at school as well. I ended up teaching maths, but mm. science was my thing, and physics was mm. a unit I was looking very much forward to because I love physics at school, but I couldn't do it at school because I had chem. I had all the TE subjects You're and stacked. I, I yeah. couldn't I couldn't do it. Yeah, okay. And that's where my self awareness came in and realized I needed to do gen. When mm. I got to the physics unit mm. at uni, I was like, oh shit. But then it clicked. I was like, formulas. Yeah. Okay. What do I put in the formulas? Variables. Yeah. Where are the variables? There, there, there. Yeah. That variable is goes for that letter. It's like it yeah. clicked, right? And then I remember the exam and I hate rope learning is so outdated. Mm. But I remember I was like, oh, how do I study for this? It's going to be multiple choice. It's going to be calculations. Okay, let's see if they have previous exams, yeah. exam papers from previous years. I was like, I'm going to look back about four years, back, 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 and then have a look at them all. And then I started noticing patterns. Yep, same. And I'm like, oh, shit. And then I looked at the last, the, the, the previous year's one. Nothing changed from that last one to the previous one before that. So I'm just going to study every single question here yeah. and specifically cater to it. Um, and at, the, at that time, I was still a hardcore procrastinator. Yeah. So I could have done a lot better. But when I opened up the first page in the exam, I was like, no fucking way. Same one. <laughs> I was like, I can literally speed run through this. I was the first one out of the exam. I, yeah. was, I had to wait. Yeah. For the, you know how like you have like a first half hour window and yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. can leave? Yes, yes. I went, shh, 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 shh. Yeah. And I'm ready. I left and everyone's like, what the fuck? I uh, smashed it. And so I'm saying, uni and school, it's a system. Yeah. Like, because yeah. obviously they got to have a system in place to teach because you can't yeah. make it too broad. Mm. If you just understand that, it's easy to kind of pass then. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you, you finished, you graduated, right? You got your Graduated degree? uni, yep. Got my two pieces of uh, paper. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Going back now to reflect back, yeah. what skills did you l learn from within the uni system that you can say you use now? Best skill I learned in uni is how to learn. Again, okay. Because you're just learning all sorts of en engineering law, bloody finance, this, this, this. It's just how to learn. Mm. And I've applied that now to business and in life anyway. Because, yeah. And you didn't, um, you didn't learn that in high school? High school, I think, was just – look, again, with the maths and the sciences, it's just a formula. So yeah. I don't actually know the concept if I actually learned it. Mm. I just knew how the formulas worked. And yeah. then there wasn't the, a why explained as They well. did explain it, but I just didn't give a shit too much. Yeah, like so, 40 watermelons, who gives a shit? Yeah, but I was just like <laughs> – I was just like, the formula's here. Like, I don't really need to understand exactly why they do mm. this, but it just makes sense here. Yeah. Cool. Just change this here. We're, we're sweet. We're done. Yeah. 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 So the first segment is done. Yeah. And I'm trying to segment segmentize this uh, podcast mm -hmm. now to really make it clean. Yeah. Second segment, we're going into now your transition into the real world where you Got finish it. your studies. Yeah. You've got your businesses that have eventually... Did, would they, did they fail? Did Bubble Soccer fail? No, we sold it actually. You sold it? Sold it so during talk, COVID as well. Can yeah. you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to talk from the... From the sales... Or from, from, from realizing you, you, you want to sell this. Like how does that work? Transition. Yeah, okay. Why I wanted to sell. So pretty much when I finished uh, uni, it was in 2016. Mm. Um, and I was extremely lost as to what I want to do because I've got these two pieces of paper that I spent a lot of time and a lot of money. So logically, like, it's probably good to go in the corporate world. So That's I had that. That's they get but you then, stuck. Hey? That's how they get you. Yeah. But then I had my businesses as well, mm. Bubble Soccer and the, the tag. So I was like, I can push that as well. But then that wasn't producing me enough income to kind of live as much as I wanted to. So I obviously had to get other casual jobs as well. So mm. I... I was the king of casual jobs. Any kind of like niche you reckon, I probably worked in that. And I was just the king of odd jobs. Um, so I was doing all of these things, but then I was still very lost in life as to what the hell I want to do because I've graduated. So I think I applied just because I thought it's the natural thing to do. I think probably about 200 jobs, grad jobs in engineering, in finance, in government, all those things. I even flew to Melbourne once for a job thing there because I was like, oh, I've kind of made it this far. May as well fly over 
But one thing that, um, and I didn't get that job, thank God. But one of the things when I asked for feedback, she goes like, I'm not actually sure why you even came here. It doesn't seem like you, your heart's in this job. Like mm. why you even want it. Interesting. And that actually was 100% true. I was there just to kind of tick a box. I'm like, cool, I'm actually trying this. So whatever. And then, um, yeah, that happened for about two years, just in limbo land doing odd jobs and applying for corporate jobs and then running bubble soccer here and there. And then one of my other jobs was working at a radio station, which I absolutely loved. We did promotions, we did the marketing, I was doing stuff in engineering, I was just doing all sorts there. It was such a fun job. And then I applied um, for a full-time position, I think three times and got rejected three times, which again is a blessing now looking back. But um the third time hit me pretty hard. And then I was like, man, I'm just yo-yoing. I've got one foot in bubble bash. I've got one foot in this job. I've got one foot trying to apply for jobs. I just need to cut it all and just have singular focus. And then I spoke with um, one of my really good friends, Hirsch, who's also been on this um, show. He was running a marketing company as well. He still is. Um, I was living with him at the time. And I think we just had a chat and just came to the conclusion that now is the perfect time for me to take risks because I love business anyway, but like I'm single, I don't have any debts, I'm pretty free. So if I fall flat, my worst case is I go into a 150K five foot job. That's my worst case because I've got the two pieces of paper. I can easily kind of just get that done. But with business, like I'm young now, I may as well just take the most of it. So that's when I decided to like cool, call up every job I had and say, no, nah, that's my last week. It's my last month. Like I'm like set. Yeah, you had a safety net. Yeah, that yeah. was it. And then you had until a contingency I had, plan. Yeah, I needed yeah. to be backed against a wall. Like mm -hmm. I forcefully needed, otherwise I'll just be in that comfort zone actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where most people are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so so talk about talk about tell me about the uh the lack of comfort zone that you've established. Where do you think you got that from? Apart from Hirsch giving the, you the heads the up. The lack of comfort. Um Yeah, the lack of like needing comfort. You, you you mentioned the lady that said you're not you're not in this the right way. Yeah, and then Hirsch said, you "I think because my yeah, just I didn't have the passion to kind of do that." And I think actually a really good um, story why I actually kind of went on this pathway. I went to exchange in Canada. I have to go backtrack a bit. Yeah, but one of my really good friends, Cal, we were having a chat uh, towards the end of our entire trip, and then um, he mentioned a story about his dad because we were all talking about like life and what we want to do, and he goes like, "Yeah." My dad said, like, if you're at the train station, you can wonder where the trains go and just sit there the whole time. Or you can actually hop on the train and then find out for yourself. Now, I took that mindset back because I wasn't sure actually what I wanted to do. But I thought the best way is just start, just do something, and then the purpose will reveal itself. Yeah. And that's what I did with bubble soccer. Um, super fun, learned a lot of skills, but then I lost the passion for that as well. And then I realized I was like, there's just no drive in this business. So I pretty much quit all the jobs, focused on bubble soccer for the next one year. I said, let's just go in business and I want to start a marketing company as well at the um, same time to diversify a little bit. Still working for myself, but it's business and just me. So did that, but then did the bubble soccer for another two years with my business partner, Tommy, and then just got to a stage where I lost the love for that as well. Cause I was like, man, we're just doing the same shit. I'm not growing here. Um, so to answer your question about comfort, I feel like if I'm doing the same thing and not growing, I think that's like, I need something else just to push myself. Mm -hmm. The bubble soccer was producing us me enough money. Again, I was very comfortable. So I said, you know, fuck it. Like, let's just sell this thing because he's got a, a full-time job. I just have no passion for this anymore. Let's try find a buyer and then I can just even go fully on kick yeah. as well afterwards. Yeah. Because I found out when you're trying to do too many things, like your attention goes everywhere as well. And you just do a shit job at them all. It's the theme of my life, really. Yeah. 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 We'll get onto that. We'll get yeah. onto that. So mm. when you sold it, you found a buyer. How did you find the buyer? So this is, yeah. Uh, the guy that used to work with us, uh, Ricky, great man. So he was one of our contractors for about two or three years. We initially pitched it to him, like when we did want to find a buyer. This was during COVID at the start. We're like, shit, how are we going to find a buyer at this time when everything's shut? But you know what? We said it might be a limiting thing. Let's just put it out there. We haven't even tried. So let's just like 
put some like marketing out some ads were actually for sale we approached ricky first but um he was working full-time at another job so we're like he would be the perfect person to take this over because he knows how the day-to-day -day runs we just got to teach him the business side on the back end yeah um but then it didn't end up for six months he was still at his job and then afterwards he approached us he goes like hey is it still for sale well like yes it is and then he goes like yeah i'm keen so um we're like are you serious They're like yeah and then um yeah it. did the deal over like a month yeah. um finalized all the transactions in one shot we gave him some training for like the next three months just mm -hmm. to kind of teach him the lead generation, the marketing, the systemization, all those kind of things, because he already knew how to run the day to day at gigs. So you got to know the back end, though. The back end, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And is it still going? Yeah, it's still going. Uh, insurance is a bitch, I know, uh, after COVID, but they are still going. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and I think also from when I do speak to him and like the marketing that he has put out or the posts, like he's he's breathing like new life into it yeah because one thing that i w was on my mind I'm like you, you always spent your, your your heart and soul to come yeah. build this thing will the next person take it on but when yeah. i kind of saw him i'm like that's pretty cool all the things that we wanted to do he's like actually doing now yeah so, well that's that's, cool. that's why i really find fascinating about businesses that mm. exist that i i look at and i go you guys can do so much better with the right branding approach yeah or the the right persona online there's nothing, and I'm just I'm just like really obsessed with the idea, especially with the what the Americans are doing, mm. uh, identifying that and going, can we buy your business? And then then mm. they're just applying their system into that business, mm. and then it just scales. Yeah. Instead of helping them, they just buy them and just do it themselves, and then make all the money. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And they're not really, and there's no kind of monetary transaction apart from the sale of the business, the acquisition yeah. of the business. Yeah. And then it's just their system, their time, their resources they already have to yeah. be, in, and there's no back and forth. There's no many chefs to the pot. It's like, we've acquired this. All right, team, bang, let's do it. That's exactly what it would kick marketing last year. I bought one of my friends, I uh, think, pretty much just to buy his systems. Yeah. Because I hate that, and I literally just paid him like a huge sum of coin just to buy all that. That's how you got kick marketing. No, no, no. That's how I scaled kick marketing to the next level last oh, year because yes. I bought another company that does the exact same thing. Yeah. For their systems. Amazing. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. How does how much does that sort of thing cost in that sort of? We did a age? we did a revenue sorry a commission split over six months, so it wasn't like a full amount in the from the get-go but for every client that came mm. on board we paid like a hefty comms up front um for that so it's easy for us for cash flow and for them in the transition when they want to wind down as well so and then there's like a no compete clause after that as well if they wanted to start another one up using their systems that they gave yeah you. i think we had a verbal kind of thing just like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. not compete because is a close friend as well so we yeah, just, yeah yeah i mean yeah. i mean that's also another topic we can get into but yeah. um so now you've got kick tell me about kick how did you decide to go right i'm going to now market instead of you know run run a physical business you know i'm so grateful that i kind of just fell into this because starting kick marketing i realized how good it is to be online and like you don't need like an office space or any mm. overheads you get paid recurring as well um paid up front so mm. all these things i'm like kind of fell into it without just by luck but how i got into meta marketing and paid ads is again my friend her she was in the google space so i said cool let me do the facebook ads kind of stuff not to compete with him but i can kind of model and see what he's been doing in his world and he was like one of my first unofficial mentors as well so um he helped me get my first three clients as well pretty he's, uh, he's a great dude top bloke got Have me on to uh the the who, who not how who not yeah how. i read that classic book and i'm like fuck yeah, that's a good book. So he got me into, well, I kind of said, cool, I'm going to go into um, Facebook ads because we did it for Bubble Bash. My first ad for Bubble Bash is still on my gram as well, my Instagram. God, it's a, yeah. A relic. <laughs> it's yeah. a relic, but it's hilarious because you just got to put yourself out there and yeah. kind of do it. So yeah, that's how I kind of started kick marketing to specialize in Facebook ads. Yeah. To go down that way, yeah. So, uh Sorry for the interruption, but this show would not be possible without the help of Bright Tank Brewery. They are the major sponsor of the Sevo Show. Huge shout outs to them. Check them out. Great beers, great people, great everything. And uh, well, let's get back to the episode. Um, if you can give some insight of where 
where we're at with meta marketing, meta ads for Instagram and Facebook, what what space do you currently see everyone in? So this is a new to, segment. We're, yeah. we're changing mm-hmm. the segment, guys. If you're hearing this, we've we've established Ashe's mm-hmm. life story. We've established his business trans, transition into, and we're going into now the the juicy parts mm-hmm. of uh, his specific niche. So, uh, for the young audiences out there, this may get a little bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> technical as well <laughs> i don't know if that's good to say on the yeah. podcast but if you're looking to get into how to advertise your future businesses keep watching this next section is definitely important so mm. facebook and instagram mm-hmm. right now what are people currently doing that's working I think one thing that is working that's never not going to work is the advertising fundamentals, just mm-hmm. literally understanding your customer and what their pain points are and how you can actually help them, your value propositions. So you've got to articulate that mm-hmm. in a really good way. So that's where the copywriting comes. That's where your branding kind of comes. So yes. that's number one. Number two is if you go on your IG, if you go on your Facebook, you'll obviously just be bombarded with ads galore. Like it's just the way it is, but it's got about getting people to stop their scroll and say attention span, whoever can control attention, they control the next step because you can have the best business in the entire world. But if you can't get people to take notice of what you have to do, deaf ears. So when it comes to advertising, your creatives, that's where you come in with all the stuff you kind of do with all mm. your hooks and stuff, the graphics, um, the ad copy, all of those things. So yeah, it's yeah. really, it, oh, I've been preaching this for ages. I, I've, I've come in organically. Yeah. And I would be, as as recently as 2022, last year, I would go, nah, ads, ads aren't necessary. Mm. Because I was like, everybody needs to go long-term play. Long-term play, yep. if it's your brand, your business, you're pushing it, it's a long-term play. But then I realized people need money now. And some of them have not got any patience and they need to see results within one to three months. And I'm like, ah, oh, I mean, we can flood the market with a lot of content and mm. then you'll be able to learn quicker and then hopefully something will hit. And I feel weird saying it, but there's never a guarantee. Mm. And then if if you do want to put a lot of money in for one video, that will increase your chances of a guarantee, whether it's an amazing hook or whatever, mm. it's still one video. So then going into quantity over quality first yeah. was always my play. Yeah. And still to this day, everyone that's done it, that mm. I've taught – to do it they have dominated Mm. they have dominated in some way that you know and all they're learning how to make content over and over and over that's the long-term play now we're into ads Mm. and i'm starting to really grow myself into it going right i see the value Mm. i still refuse to learn myself it's the who, not the how, right? Yeah, yeah. Like when, when we, we sat down and, and, and you told me to do something, I'm like, where do I go? And then we zoomed each other mm. and I shared my screen. You're like, that's not what it's supposed to look like. Mm. That's my fucking problem. Mm. It's like you guys have all got a completely different portal. You show people how to do it on that portal. And then when I go do it, it's a completely different setting. You're like, ah, I gotcha. Now you have to use me. Mm. But that's just me not knowing how to navigate. Mm. Instagram, Facebook ads, people are doing doing the fundamentals. They're looking at the creative. They're testing, analyzing. What is the pro tip now, the advanced pro tip to get the attention using ad spend wisely? What's the pro tip? Good God. Um, it's simple. It's actually not that hard. You just got to literally, again, it just comes down to understanding what goes through your ideal customer's mind yeah. and speak it out. So let me give you an example. Um, my ads, actually. So I work with a lot of uh, builders and developers to generate them leads. My best ad is, I thought about this, is a lot of builders and, sorry, new home reps and property companies, they get paid once the slab goes down. Most of the time. So I took a picture literally at a housing block with a finger pointing up at a slab. Best ad. No text whatsoever. It stops the scroll. Just got to understand what goes on in the consumer's mind. So yeah. it varies from every business to business. Yeah. Once you understand the fundamentals, you translate that. Yeah. Mm. And how do, you, how do you navigate that, finding that with a customer when they 
when they don't know themselves. Yeah, have an onboarding uh, survey to kind of extract exactly what you need. So just with our processes we've developed over time is a lot of businesses are also too close as well to their own thing. So they may think that they're really great at this or they're really great at this, but it's just the story they've told themselves and because it's just too close to it. So it's asking them the right questions because whenever we bring on a client, we probably ask the same question about four times. And I tell them as well, hey, by the way, we're going to ask you the same thing in four different ways. Don't get annoyed if we just got to see if there's any gaps, any holes. And that generally does pick up any holes because then you go, like, oh, but didn't you say this? You're like, yeah, shit, I did too. So yeah, that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. And um, is there any any specific uh, field that you really enjoy um, advertising for? Property is our main niche. So buyer leads, investment property kind of leads. I really love that just because the impact you can actually make on people because actually buying a property is like a pretty big deal for yeah. most people, whether yeah. it's to live in or for investment, but that's going to leave a lasting impression for the whole life because that's going to help them retire, get cash flow right now, help sell their kids and so on. So I think the ripple effect helps, like it feeds my soul in property and we're also great at it, which is why we do it. But another one is also in the healthcare kind of space. So like when with dentists or like skin clinics or those kind of things, because the way we present ourselves, the way we feel about our bodies emotionally, I think is a huge deal. So if you can help someone in a transformation, for example, yeah. with their teeth, for example, like that fuels my soul as well, that we could connect like someone that had a problem yeah. with the solution with our clients. Yeah. We're kind of that bridge. So makes me feel good that we're kind of playing out a part in the world. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a connector, but you're optimizing it through your skills of yeah. channeling yeah. in different ways you know, yeah. the way that the meta advertising space works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's mm. cool. What is what is uh, in the near future for this space, for ads, for meta ads, for businesses? Tell you what, meta ads evolves every single week. I jump into the BM or the uh, account for the ads and stuff and then it just changed the whole time. So the technical platform changes all the time, but that's up to media buyers like myself and so on just to understand. But... I feel it might get a bit more expensive. Who knows? Just to market. Where's the cheapest attention to purchase right now? I'd say reels. Yeah. Instagram reels. Yeah. With ads. There's spend? a night and day difference for one of our clients literally on reels. We just run ads specifically on reels. Yeah. That's it. Cause that just gets the most um, views, the most clicks, the most purchases. Amazing. So yeah. What sort of business is it? E-commerce. It's, um, very proud of it actually because it's a $49 product so it's actually quite hard to get like a ROAS at times for like such a low value SKU item mm -hmm. but actually you're in the, the key of the castle for this yeah so we've spent probably about two years on this one product it's going up and down but for past year one single video that we cracked on is just producing us just insane wins like the ROAS is between three and probably five some that might be a little bit small but for a $49 product that's really fucking good I'd say um it's video content. There's this one piece of content that we have, I'll, I'll, I'll show you after, just triggers people unintentionally. We didn't even plan that. It just triggers people, gets a lot of engagement. It pushes um, Facebook ads to say it's a popular post and we just get insane reach. People just purchase off that one. Amazing. That one video. And you can just let it fly. Yeah. We try to rep, uh, replicate that now because we obviously got the formulas. We get other people just, hey, can you make a same video in a different style though? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Mm. But that's what I mean like, where I come in with the organic side yeah. and you flood the market with a hundred organic videos yeah, and then you analyze from those hundred and generally it's between five to 10% depending on yeah. how good you are with creative and editing and the hook. And then from that you can pretty much grab those 10% to run ads with. Yeah. But in, on the other side of the fence, what people are doing is they create 10 videos from the straight off the bat and go, we're going to put ads behind this and it's going to work. Yeah. I'm finding that that doesn't work as well as the organic side, but they prefer it because of time. You get data quicker though. So yeah. again, it's, it's, you're either investing time or you're investing money. money. Yeah. If you got both, then sweet. Yeah. Um, I like the, I like, I'm yeah. all for and. Yeah. Like long form and sh short form. Yeah. Because I say to people, I'm like, what are you doing with your brand? in two to five years time yeah because every campaign you run once the ad spend finishes that video is gone yeah what are you doing organically to build your brand in perpetuity where your clients your customers your fans yeah have your attention 
and you can go, right, hey, I'm doing this uh, yeah. next week. You should check it out. And do you know, building a brand, I've actually learned how critical it is more so in the past six months because a lot of the clients we kind of work with are really great at sales. So traditionally, we've relied on they can convert clients because they can close sales easily. But if you don't have the sales capabilities and not trying to be like a scammy kind of guy or anything, <laughs> but just how to communicate with people quite quite well to kind of guide them down the buying process. If you don't have that, they're going to be researching you compared to your competitors. Are you posting content? Do you have t like testimonials? Yes. So all of these things, actually, I used to say like you don't need a website before, but you actually do it like, validates you for, for business yeah yeah and if you're not making sales organically anyway yeah then paid ads are just going to magnify a problem that's already there yeah. so you've got to be very critical as to when you actually start with ads as well yeah, yeah. i've been learning a bit about seo yeah um but i've also been learning more about the ai side of things yeah I know you so are. Yeah. <laughs> when i was i was on snapchat a few few months ago now yeah i don't know if i told you this story but don't um know. They implemented an AI bot that you can chat to. Okay. Yes. Yep. So I started chatting to it, and the AI bot said to me, "What do you like to do for fun?" I'm like, "Well, oh, I hang out with my wife and Fremantle. Mm. You know, Fremantle specifically." And she goes, "Oh, that's cute. Uh, I recommend you check out Little Creatures and Bread and Common, mm. both places we've been to frequently and both places we like." Yep. And I was like, "That's interesting." Mm. So turn my marketing channel on my mm. put my marketing hat on and go hey listen let's say i was starting a business mm. in Fremantle. Mm. how do i get you to recommend my business just like you did with little creatures and bread in common first mm. and it told me it told me what it was looking for which is which is the website is fresh yeah your content is consistent yeah and you're getting google reviews yes I didn't understand how powerful that was yeah. until like literally this year. I was like, no, you don't need this. And then I'm like, no, this is so valuable because you, if you get price shopped or like, yeah, yeah, if you get head to head against the competitors, if everything's the same, so who would they trust more? Yeah. So yeah. now I'm thinking, I don't know if there's a term for this, but maybe AIO. Are you artificially intelligently optimized? Or SEO yeah. AI, or I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I'm not trying to coin anything. Maybe I am. Mm. But I realize, and the, the tool that I'm building, SS Live, the, mm. there's a back end research function that we have mm. that helps analyze the brand. You drop your URL in, and it understands your yeah. brand. It understands all the pain points, it understands mm. the target audience, the what, the why, the who, the how. Mm just from a URL link because mm. it stalks it. It even does like a Google research to see what peop other people are saying. Yeah, right. And sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah. And I look at it carefully of why it doesn't work because I'm trying to figure out if it's the app or the mm. website. Mm. And more recently we found that it doesn't work because of the website. Mm. We look in the website and we analyze the words and go, oh, it's not. It's it's barely SEO optim uh, optimized. Uh, optimized. Yeah. SEO optimizer doesn't make sense. Yeah, uh, it's barely it barely has any good SEO, mm. and the AI now is going. I'm confused. Mm. So if there's a competing brand that is looking to get that, hey, old mate, I don't want to say it because it'll trigger my phone. Mm. Can you recommend me the best place to go to in Fremantle? Mm. And it whoever is optimized. In those three ways, the AI will pick it up and go, these guys. Yeah. And I think people will be scrambling to figure that out. I think people should be already thinking about yeah. that big time. Because the kids Gen Alpha, mm. I'm seeing little little videos pop up on TikTok where the kid gets out of bed and he turns on his, his Alexa mm. and he goes, he wants to play I'm Still Standing by old mate um, John, uh, Elton John. Yeah. And um, yeah, he just stands up. So can you play play this? And he starts vibing, getting yeah, ready yeah. for his day. And I'm like, that's Gen Alpha. Yeah. Ten years from now, all they're going to do is go, uh, recommend me a pizza, please. Yeah. Bang, first one. Yeah. Convenience, speed, everything. Yeah. And these brands now are thinking about that. They're not thinking about that. I should that voice search would be like a bigger thing. Huge. Um, Huge. I don't think it's taken off as yet, as much as I thought it would. 
Not yet. Yeah. I think the more people put out content, the yeah. more voice recognition there is. And yeah. The more times you drop specific keywords, like in this podcast. Yeah. Right? Because I look at TikTok and I see um, how it categorizes my videos. Yeah. If it doesn't get enough views, it doesn't get categorized at all. But mm. then it's like, okay, we need to improve the views. And then I go put in the keywords in the video that it picks up on that it's talked, that yep. it's spoken as well, the audio, mm. and then in the captions and stuff as well. But I also notice that it categorizes based off of what other people say. Yeah. And technically you can think that a comment is is a review. Mm. Whether, I mean, my first 10 comments are just kids going first, second, early, yeah. <laughs> here went before go, going viral. Yeah. <laughs> so that doesn't help me being categorized at all. Yeah. Um, which is frustrating, but at the same time, you know, mm. you, you know, you've made it. But um, like one video, I was interviewing these kids from New Zealand, yeah, and nothing was mentioned about their accents at all. Mm. But it was categorized into New Zealand accents yeah. because half the comments were, "Oh my god, we, they love, we love their accent, accent, accent." Yeah. So now, anytime someone searches the video, they they if or if they search up Kiwi accent. <laughs> Your video, bam. My yeah. video pops up. Yeah. And now I'm like, how do we how do we strategize for that to do that with brands organically and, you know, create a like a viral moment, but also categorize it so people find it easier. It's searchable. To benefit yeah, to mm. yeah, searchable to benefit for AI as well. Yeah. Because I'm I'm talking about beyond SEO now. Mm. I'm talking about beyond organic content. I'm talking about beyond ads, I'm talking about people's convenience and going, what are they going to be doing in 10 years' time to search up these businesses? Yeah. And then I'm talking to those businesses now, planting the seed, going, do you plan to retire in five to 10 years or do you want to make a play? Mm. And people don't want to think ahead that, that, that far. Because AI as well, I think it's, uh, it's still such a new thing, even though it's, it's been out there for a while though. Mm. But... Um, it's if you don't adopt it now, I feel like your competitors are already doing it yeah. anyway. So the systems, well, yeah. oh my. The, like yeah. two days ago, the new GPT 4.5 turbo yeah. released and that's four times faster yeah. and four times cheaper yeah. for my API, yeah. for, my, for my, the, my thing. And my version one was, is, so we're still using it to test, is technically redundant. Yeah. Because... Of their new update. It's so quick that just the way it goes, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, now you can build your own, mm. your own module inside of ChatGPT, which is huge. Yeah. Like I'm getting nostalgic feelings of when I first opened up our, um, ChatGPT last November. Yeah. And then this November, that's like insane. Ooh. Yeah. But I've already found the gaps. I've already found the areas of pain. Mm. And I'm going, oh, well. It's not good enough now. It's not good enough now. Mm. But I reflect back and go, what is everyone else saying? Mm. 99% of them think that my biz, my thing is redundant. I'm like, no, it's not. Version two, the user interface is much cleaner, much easier to use and anybody can use it. Mm. You can't build that on ChatGPT mm. yet. Mm. When ChatGPT's user interface features come out, which I probably will think in another year, yeah, then I'll then there will be some problems. But by then, I will have evolved SS the Live next into thing anyway, a yeah. monster. Yeah. So you got to keep up with the times. Yeah. Now that's my story mm. of me adapting to AI. I'm not seeing businesses adapt to AI, mm. and there are functionalities that you can get now. You can code into a card. Or you can get people to Google review you within seconds. Yeah. Right? Yeah. NFC chip, mm. bang, other side, QR code for an offer, that car becomes your little voucher. Yeah. It's called Tap Connect. We mm. actually made this product. Yeah, yeah. And we already have businesses mm. wanting it. And Tap Connect is just one example of a hospitality industry needing to leverage yeah you create something that people go if i don't get that and my competitor does and it works for them mm. holy shit that's ai so it takes I've, it back as well because a yeah. lot of the companies on that on google mm. generally the ones that have the most five stars and the most testimonials they're the ones that get the most clientele as well so if yeah. you're not adapting to it yeah we're too slow to it 
mm. you'll get left behind. So I haven't validated this stat completely yet. Yeah. But um, it makes sense. Every 0.1 star increase to a hospitality business yeah. is like a between a 5 to 9% revenue increase. That's a great stat to lead in with then as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. And Google reviews have released a feature a couple of months ago. Yeah. Where you can filter by star rating. Yeah. 4.5 and above. Yes. 4 and above, 3.5 and above. Now, when you Google, I don't know, wine bar in Northbridge, mm. you're going to have get a whole bunch of different bars. Mm. And they're going to be sponsored ones. Yeah. Your mates. The and then you're going to have just like, SEO, opt- uh, SEO, yeah. right? Mm. SEO bit. I see some that are in the top three or four that are sitting on 4.4. 4. Yeah. And then I can see people going filter by star rating, 4.5 4 and above, it disappears. Yes. Then yeah. I go to that 4.4 4 star rating brand and go, how many reviews does it have? Okay. What's the star rating? 4.4. 4. Mm. Calculate it using maths. To go to 4.5, how many on average reviews do you need at five stars to get there? And it'll spit it out. Yeah. I'm like, oh, 100. Oh, this, this business has got 350 since it's opened, I don't know, five, 10 years ago. We have a product that can get reviews so much quicker than ever before. Yeah. And people are seeing those, you know, those Google taps yeah. to Google mm. on the counter. No one gives a shit. No one, you see it, mm. subconsciously see it. You've seen it and you're like, oh yeah, but you never remember to review. But I wouldn't do it until they tell me to kind of do it. There's no incentive. There's no, yeah. But even then, until they're like staring down your throat going, mm. review it right now, mm. you're not going to do it. And they're not going to do that either because they don't have the confidence. There's no incentive. Mm. Not, not for the staff anyway. But I think yeah. the, the hospitality industry, the businesses who realize this, and make it a game and make mm. it a competition and make it an incentive, they will start to see the increase in, in customer. It's just simple thing as well. It's just simple thing. Simple thing. Right. Add that in with content. And this is something I've told a couple of hospitality brands now. Get your staff to film shit. Mm. What are they doing when it's not a big rush? Are they doing odd jobs that don't really matter just because just to keep them busy so that you can validate their twenty five dollars an hour? Yeah, you know it would validate their twenty five dollars an hour and probably get them a promotion mm. if they create a piece of content mm. that is interesting to the public mm. that goes viral. And they're on the front lines as well. They're the best people to do it as well. The ROI on yeah. that is huge. Yeah, and they're not doing it now. I understand if you're a bartender or a waitress and you you don't want to fucking do it you're genuinely not that person mm. fair enough but what i reckon they should do is they can they should hire especially with gen z and gen alpha coming into the workforce soon 27 28 of the workforce now is gen z anyway yeah they're all on their phones they're all on tiktok all the time you need to grab your you need to hire people going we're looking for a hospitality person who is sa- uh, internet instagram reels or tiktok savvy yeah. You know how many people... There's are, so many there anyway, yeah. yeah and they're yeah. so quick as well just to make it. They're yeah. like, how'd you bash that out? That's so quick. Exactly. And, yeah. and like, I know how to do it. Yeah, yeah. But like, I'm telling the kids now, right now, if you want to do a easy job, mm. I mean, hospitality is not easy, but it is pretty, pretty simple. It's just, you have to deal it's with people. Poor stuff, yeah. It's a <laughs> shitty, shitty part of it, yeah. right? The, the, the shitty part is the people. And even retail as well. But like... If you have, if you add an uh, another skill set, yeah, and you make that content, mm. you can leverage a pay rise. You can leverage your worth. You can your become values a lot more because you it's can, a, it's, yeah. it's tangible as well. Yeah, and yeah. you can become a junior marketer. You can yeah. you, you can become a marketer without a degree. I don't have a fucking marketing degree. Neither do I. <laughs> Neither do I. Right. But this is what I mean. Like you do not need to go to school or or uni to to do the marketing. What you need to do is have a, the passion. So. I think that's my prediction. Like these these businesses are going to go, can you do TikToks? Mm. Like would you be able to do TikToks? And then they go, well, what's in it for me? Mm. You know, they don't have to do it because yeah. it's just another add-on. <coughs> I hated going to businesses to talk to their internal marketing teams 
when I rock up, I can see in their eyes after the initial kind of couple of times because then they, they get a bit like, oh, it's mm. Sevo. But after the initial couple of times, they go, fuck, I have to actually learn how to do this now mm. as part of my job and I don't like it. But I'm a marketer and it is my job. Mm. So they add the job description or whatever. I'm like, this is going to be a huge problem for companies yeah, because they have an internal marketing team that isn't creative. So what do they do? Outsource. Outsource. Mm. And the outsource, do they know the ins and outs of the business? Mm. No, they take weeks, months to figure it out and then hope that it happens yeah. for them and then splash some ad spend behind it and hope that it happens. Whereas if you go internal with people inside that actually are invested, mm. you give them that incentive – and when it starts working, I this is I've done this to almost every single client that that has yeah. taken it on. They still have to do the reps. So all the clients that have ever done the reps have all succeeded in this. Mm. But then the next question goes: How do we measure the ROAS or the ROI? The ROI it? on it, yeah. That's when the ads really come in. Yeah. Like my, I, I learned a little bit about TikTok ads and, and mm. running it all, and I, I was like, all right, I'm going to spend half a day to just commit to this. Yeah. And creative was good. And we had – it was like one of the best launches that I've ever been a part of. We had yep. so many people come in through the door. It was a hospitality thing. Mm. Um, it was like a new nightclub up north. But um, after that, there was too, too many chefs in the pot and I was like, this is fucked. <laughs> yeah. This is fucked. Make this content. Don't reject it. Let's see how it goes. Don't overthink it. When it goes viral, because it will, because you didn't overthink it, yeah. we're going to put ad spend behind it. And if it doesn't work, no one cares. No one gives a fuck. They're going to forget it anyway. <laughs> so. One of my biggest ones, <laughs> I remember, uh, there's a story I had. I had two different um, people I interviewed for a content for, for this concept. Yeah. And I said, what's your biggest red flag that you see in a guy? Yeah. And I'd answer. Like, funny questions. Funny answers. And then I did it with the girl. Uh, with a guy, what's mm. the biggest red flag you see in a girl? You know, tell the red flags. I was like, great, these are both great pieces of content. It's going to go, you know, potentially viral. Anyway, put the girl one out, does well. Yeah. Sweet. Let's put the guy one out. No, nah, can't do it. It's too misogynistic. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> no one cares, bro. And I was like, fuck, man. <laughs> misogynistic, nice. Good God. So, yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, that was a bit of a rant. <laughs> Just going to get that off your uh, yeah, chest, I, I can tell you. Yeah. I had to get that one out. Yeah, but um, yeah. I think like what I've learned moving into this space after doing three years stint with different companies, yeah. like Red Rooster was fun, but they're too corporate. Good money, too corporate. And but, no idea. But I feel your, your style was quite good because I've been following you even before we – we were mates and mm. I was like, oh, fuck it, Sevo, shit. Because I follow you from being a teacher yeah. on TikTok. I was like, his style's really good anyway. Yeah. Thank but, you. Yeah. But like I've had people tell me like, Sev, ever since you stopped creating content for Red Rooster, their content's been shit. Mm. And I'm like, can you tell them that? Because I genuinely wanted to help. Mm. But there was a moment where I did really well. Yeah. And then they said, we want you to do this. We want you to do this now. And yeah. I'm like. Why the fuck would you want me to do that? Mm. That won't work. Mm. And I don't get to be my creative self, which is what you hired me for. And yeah. then I was like, I'm out. Do you know who's got a really good way of um, socials is Ryanair. Oh, Ryanair. They, 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 they are classic. Every business talks about Ryanair. <laughs> yeah. And every business wants to be like Ryanair, but every business can't be like Ryanair. No. Because they don't have internal com co per people that have creative freedom. 100%. That yeah. is the golden rule to dominate on tiktok these days hire an intern that understands your brand but give them creative freedom and don't freak out if they post something edgy because they post some edgy stuff it's hilarious yeah. but i yeah. think that's where the authenticity of the brand yeah. also comes into place because you can't fake that kind of no. stuff if like let's say i don't know mac is trying to do it you'd be like dude what the fuck like oh bro uh, mac is mm. fucking they they dropped they fumbled yeah, okay. I had – they were doing – you know, like every now and then someone like famous comes to Australia yeah. and then they do like a like a meal for them, about them. Okay, sure. Like yeah. two, three weeks. They, they had the Jack Harlow right. whatever. And yeah, yeah, yeah. BTS came in and yeah. they had like some Korean sauce with their chicken. It was a good meal. Mm. 
And I was like, I'm going to bootstrap this and see if I can force a meal on their menu. Yeah. Because I've seen it done in America. I was like, all right, I'll give it a go. Went up to the drive-thru. I was like, this is how you get the Sevo meal. And then I was like, can I get a high out? <laughs> And then he goes, and then fortunately the guy recognised me because you know yeah. they got the cameras. Yeah. He's like, oh yeah. I was like, cool. And then we drove through and, he, and, then, and then he played along. He goes, oh yeah. Did you, did you say oh yeah me? I was like, yeah, oh yeah. And he's like, yep, that'll be this much. And then I got my meal, which was actually 20 nuggets and a Sprite. Yeah. Because that's what I was feeling that day with some mustard Cajun fucking shit. Mm. And it got like half a million views. Mm. Everyone was tagging Maccas. I even messaged them because they follow me on Instagram after yeah. my project I did a couple of years ago. Nothing. Mm. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, this is this is what you need to do. Like, I still have the most organic viral piece of content in the country for yeah. a fast food brand, Red Rooster. Yeah. We just sat down in the restaurant and just said, No one comes, no one comes here. Look. And that's what people were commenting, sorry. And then I was like, pan around, proof that they're actual customers. I remember seeing this one, yes. That I remember went seeing that. fucking viral. Because that was on my mind as well. And yeah. I'm like, that's a great piece of content. Yeah. No one's doing this. Yeah, no yeah, one's yeah. taking the piss out of themselves because yeah. they're so fixated on yeah. staying. Oh, my God. But I think so. also with um, with the way the corporate world was, it might limited kind of way into it, is like everyone's trying to not do best for the actual job, but it's the best job to look good for the higher up anyway. So that might be the best decision. But the higher the up doesn't get it. Yeah, you know? I don't know. So yeah. I'm excited about this venture because mm. the SS Live thing, it's ours. The marketing, yeah, completely ours. Mm. I've already recorded like 15 pieces of content with this whiteboard and it's just me being a dickhead. Mm. And we'll see what, what happens with this. We'll see how it runs. A great... Split test, yeah. Yeah. Between that one and this, yeah. Yeah. How long do you split test for before you call it quits? Is there like a where, – where's the marker where you're going to go, yep, we can upgrade this to the next level? You can look at the data. So a classic point is we're doing a landing page campaign for a client um, to send traffic there. Getting really good click-through rate. Again, very technical, but that's pretty much how many people go off your ad that have seen your ad. So that's a good ratio. Very high – CTR, yep. but then nobody signs up on the actual page. So it tells us, cool, the content's great, the ads are great, something's wrong on the, the back website. Yeah. yeah. So then we did two different versions of the landing page, mm -hmm. still crickets on there. We did another two, and then bingo, bang, leads flooding in again. So to answer your question is you just got to look at the data. So, so it's testing. It's, it's always testing, testing. But it's also understanding how the marketing works, all the, click, the yeah. CTRs. Yeah, the cost per leads, all those kind of things. I'm so. very excited to do this testing venture yeah. and seeing what happens and that confidence. And this is and like a case in point here because I told you like, we got two spam leads. Yeah, great, it happens. But now this is where the marketing comes into it. We've yeah. got to like optimize and see what's working and what's not, and then we kind of fine tune. Exciting, exciting. Yeah, from there. Okay, so we're going into the uh, the hour now. We're uh, rolling over the hour. We are now moving into something called pod decks pod decks so it's an app cool. uh, pod decks it's, i have to pay for it but it's really yeah. cool so um i want to go back to your personal side and yeah. ask you some questions about if you really know about the topic so sure um i'll give you i'll throw you some um uh, throw you some topics and you pick one and we'll go for it cool. okay we've got the hustle mm. so hustle life um the beatles maybe if you're a beatles fan um great inventions True crime, movie night. We've got techie, conspiracy theories, mm -hmm. and we're going to go with, let's go with entrepreneurial secrets. Now, they're not going to be like, I ask you, uh, it's, not, it's not trivia. It's yeah, just yeah. stuff, like a topic that interests you the most that you, can, you reckon you could talk about. Let's go last one. Oh. The secrets. On the entrepreneurial yeah. sequence. The That's great what I love choice. anyway. Yeah. What's the scariest thing about entrepreneurship? You don't know where it's gonna go. You could literally put something out amazing and think it's gonna like be the king of the world and then it flops completely. So just that uncertainty factor. Mm. That uncertainty factor and going through that and getting out on the other end is 
part of earning your stripes as a real entrepreneur. Mm. If you can't go through that, if you won't go through that, it's definitely not for you. It's going to test you as well because 100%. once you go through it, you'll understand what you're actually made of. And I know a lot of people as well, like they started businesses and then it was too hard and it's completely fine. Mm. Don't do something else. Like, I think that's fine, but it is going to test you. Yeah. yeah. So what advice would you have for people who want to start their entrepreneurship? Uh, sorry, I'll start again. What advice would you give people thinking about becoming an entrepreneur? Just start. Literally, I don't have, didn't have a business plan whatsoever. I'm like, well, just start because the, the hardest thing is just starting. I say like um, the hardest thing for me is like going to a group fitness class is just rocking up to the class or actually just driving um, to the gym. Yeah, get in get, the car. Uh, just get the door. That's literally it. Just Put your start. clothes on. Yeah. Just start because you're going to get feedback and mm. the feedback's important because you're not going to hit the goal from like day one. It's just business. Mm. You're not going to make it perfect, but just start. That's it. it. Yeah. Who's your entrepreneurial idol? Fuck, I have a few, eh? So one of my good friends, Hirsch, obviously. I've just seen, obviously we're quite close. I've seen what, what he's kind of doing, just being close to just just the hard work that he's just put in. Um, my other friend, Blake Burton as well. So I was with him like last night. So I'm very fortunate. I've got like a really good close friends of like business people as well that we can vibe off, which is I thought everybody runs their own thing and has a group of friends that just run their own thing, but it's actually not like that. It's collaborative. You've got to be yeah. collaborative. Because we were like last night, we we're just b bouncing stuff off of this. We're like, holy shit, this is going to like have legs for this new yeah. product that they're doing. Yeah. But aside from like my, my mates, I reckon um, from afar, um, Malcolm Turnbull. <laughs> Malcolm Turnbull? Malcolm Turnbull. Okay, all right. I well, uh, read his book and um, yeah, the, the, the guy's a G. He's a very <laughs> smart man, yeah. All right, we're going to do a speed round now. Cool. Speed round and then we'll finish it off. Cool. Um, should, budding entrepreneur, should budding entrepreneurs take out business loans to grow their business? <laughs> Fuck. Um, not the start, no. No. If you don't have the skills, yeah. yeah. Do it afterwards, yeah. 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 Um, what's your entrepreneurial backstory? Actually, we already did that one. Yeah. What is your view on hustle culture when it comes to entrepreneurship? There's going to be a period when you are going to have to hustle. It's not a bad thing, but it's all about being consistent in business. If you're hustling all the time, most likely you'll get burnt out. Yeah. So it's about there will be periods. You just got to do it. Yeah. yeah. How do you deal with difficult business-related news that directly affects you? Like, for example, the 14.5 iOS update. Shit happens in business, man. Like, it's it's... Yeah, you just ad adapt. Like, you're never going to get like, like a perfect run. Just yeah. adapt. That's it. Adapt. Shit Improvise. Changes. Overcome. Shit. Bear girls. Yeah. And finally, what is your overall goal in your entrepreneurial journey? So that's a great question because I used to have these re revenue targets and they just fucked me up completely. But my goal is just if I can help two new businesses every single month that I can bring in, I'm sweet. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And for the young ones... Mm. Entrepreneurship aside, yep. one piece of advice you'd give them about anything, what would it be? It's all going to work out. It's very cliched, but it's all going to work out. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it. Just like this podcast. Mm. I've set it up. Got the cameras going. You're seeing us here. The lighting's good. The audio hopefully is good. And uh, you've enjoyed the show. Please like and subscribe. <laughs> I hate saying that, but you know, you got to do it. Got to do it, mate. Shout out to Bright Tank as always for um, keeping us, uh, keeping the lights on. Shout out to Camera Electronic for keeping the cameras on and also the lights and uh, the audio. Uh, shout outs to, yeah, the people watching. You guys are the guys and girls that are making this happen. Please review and leave a five star thing on my thing because we're talking about reviews. It'd be good. It would be helpful. If you don't think it, deserved a five-star review please comment in the video telling me why how we can improve it if you're on spotify leave a uh, answer to the question of what you thought about the episode and uh for everything else there's mastercard and ashe with his details in the description on both channels so thanks again for listening as always good Cheers, thanks Seb. thank you